at the moment, there's so much up in the air, you can get away with doing something that you thought might be a bad idea before, giving it a try. If you've had a suspicion that you could make a change that would be really good, but you've been a bit cautious about upsetting customers, I don't think they'll be upset right now. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. As we've discovered throughout the series, cafes, casual eateries and restaurants are not the huge money earners many outside the industry may think. Most are often run on the scent of an oily rag by small families who put everything they have on the line to do something they love every day. We've featured many restaurants on this series, but what of the hole in the walls? The eateries dishing up cheap lunches and cheap meals accessible to everyone the sort of meals people are happy to queue for. Mary McIntyre is the co-owner of Castlemaine's superhero Barn Me. Mary, how are you? I'm good today. Thank you, Huck. It's been a bit of a whirlwind couple of weeks in Victoria. Uh, what's, what's the last couple of weeks been like for you? Well, it's, it's been interesting for me. Um, I uh, reopened, let me think, oh, you know, we, we did close for four weeks at the end of March uh, and I reopened thinking I'd probably be very quiet and needing to kind of really minimise what we were doing and consolidate and after two days I realised, oh God, I need more staff back. We were very busy. Um, in fact, a little busier than we had been prior to shutdown. Wow. And uh, it was quite quite surprising, yeah. Um, and I think there's a number of reasons for that. Um, we, we are a hole in the wall, as you said before. We're on, off the main strip. And although we've always been pretty busy, um, I think there were still people who didn't know about us. So um, the lineups <laughs> actually helped us. Everybody waiting outside, I think people were driving past saying, what is that? Uh, we also had... A different population here because Castlemaine is a community city, a town. A lot of people work in Melbourne, but they've been grounded in Castlemaine and so they're able to come, whereas they never were really, possibly on the weekends. We do see a lot of Melbourne folk on the weekends. So that's where I lead to the last few weeks have been pretty amazing and I've been very thankful for the loyalty of Castlemaine. But Saturday was a very different, it felt a lot like pre-shutdown the first time. Um, I think our sales were down 40% on Saturday and that's the first time that's happened. Um, and I don't know if that's uh, just a temporary blip or if it really is because of Melbourne's shutdown. We, Saturdays are usually our Melbourne day. You know, we get a lot of day trippers and weekenders. So, uh, yeah, so I am really unsure. I would love to say things are great. And then it's just, as they keep saying, it's uncertain times, yes. After you did shut down for four weeks and you opened again, did you re rechange what your offering was to the market? Not completely, no. I, you know, it's a funny thing. I, when I started this, I had a very firm idea that I wanted to, I, I wanted to eliminate food waste in a food business. That was something really close to my heart. And so I was very strict that we would have quite a small menu and we would do specials, but we would stick to what we do and do a few things and do them really well. And um, so that, really aligns well with the kind of where the trends we're looking at now so there wasn't so much need to change my menu although specials are not something i'm really throwing into the mix at the moment so we do um soup we do pho we do bay me uh three ways vegetarian pork chicken we do bun which is a noodle dish pork chicken tofu again and bao and that's really they all work together there's a consolidation of product there's a consolidation of movement and activity in the kitchen and it's pretty simple so it's made us very quick and easy uh, I would say about maybe 40 to 50 percent of our customers were already takeaway we're a tiny spot uh, technically we fit 12 people uh, I think some locals might know that that gets pushed sometimes but um, so uh, we were not necessarily changing everything but I 
uh, it was more of sort of the physical space changed. Um, I moved the counter right up to the door. No one can walk in. Uh, no one can sit inside to wait for their food. Um, and so that hence the lineups. And, um, you know, part of me was thinking, oh, maybe this is a time where I can start bringing more things back in, trying different things. I thought I'd have a bit more free time on my hands to play around, but actually it's just been incredibly busy and we're just keeping up with it all. Yeah. So we're takeaway only and you can't be in here, but that's the major change. Yeah. What's the average day like for you? It's a pretty low average spend, your uh, venue. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, look, it's, you know, we are, are only open three hours of the day at the moment. Uh, so that would be another change that I should have said. Uh, we used to be open for five hours. And what I've noticed is we're making um, about the same amount, you know, so there's another consolidation there of just squeeze it all into those three hours. So it's flat out. We're getting a lot of, you know, the min the sort of average spend has really risen. That's mainly because we're getting people um, who are at home with their families. So usually we would be a lunch spot for people who are working or people in town. Uh, we're now getting sort of, you know, we're running out of boxes all the time because we're sort of getting about five items per order. Um, I get in here, you know, it's a quite a Look, I have to say it's quite a relaxing kind of lifestyle <laughs> that I've given myself with this restaurant. I get in here around 9.30, often drop my kids off at school and then get here. I go pretty hard until 12 when we open. We're usually getting calls for orders from 11 because we used to be open at 11 and, and we've actually decided it's a good way of pacing our lunch is still taking those orders from 11 and telling them they'll be ready at 12 when we open. Uh, and it goes pretty much non-stop, flat out, very busy, phone call ringing all the time until three. And uh, then we pack down and we can often get out of here by 3.30. It's, um, it's very respectable. <laughs> How vital is that high volume to the success and viability of the restaurant? It's important. Uh, if it wasn't there, yeah, I wouldn't be making enough money. And, you know, when I first started this, it was a bit slow to start with. I was kind of in, um, taking a gamble that it would build. And um, it, the idea behind it was I really was just giving myself a job. I didn't think I would need more than maybe one employee. Um, I kind of, you know, my idea behind it was very sort of... Um, it was a bit speculative. Uh, I'd, I'd had a business in, in Canada for seven years that was big. I had 14 employees. Um, it was a big volume. I, I was pretty exhausted by it and had really thought I would probably wouldn't get back in the game again. Um, but as a chef, there's not a lot of jobs for chefs in this town. You're really gonna have to go to Bendigo or Dalesford or Kyneton. I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do here. And then I thought, oh, you know, my husband's growing all these, and my husband who is Vietnamese and was growing lots of Vietnamese ingredients for our family, um, it was too much. Like we couldn't eat it all and it wasn't quite enough for a market stall. So I was thinking, oh, maybe I'll just do a little um, bang me market stall. It really was a bit of a kind of pop-up idea. Um, and then uh, the ice cream shop here in town had a space they wanted to kind of rent out for pop-up. So I gave it a go and it was always a bit tentative. And so at first I wasn't quite sure if it would be enough to really give me much of a living, but it, it grew pretty quickly. And so I started looking for a proper spot, which took a long time. And then I finally realized this was the spot. So I bought out the ice cream shop. They, you know, they've still got their ice cream shop. I've got my little shop next to it now with my own kitchen. And all of a sudden it took off really quickly once I sort of really establish myself as my own brand yeah there's been a lot of talk about the changing landscape of the offering in in food service and hospitality with workers potentially not going back to offices and perhaps staying as mm -hmm. you mentioned in Castlemaine have you noticed a change there and do you think that that will change as well mm. to become bigger food hubs outside of cities yeah, I wonder. I mean, yeah, I'm sure there are a lot of satellite towns like Castlemaine that all of a sudden have an influx of the people who worked in Melbourne, grounded in Castlemaine or grounded in the town. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, that's actually been an issue for Castlemaine for many years is that people don't spend money in the town, they spend it in the city they work in, whether it's Bendigo or Melbourne. And and that could actually be good for the town. I, I don't really have any data to back that up, but <laughs> people may start <laughs> shopping more locally, you know. Um, I think it's it's a hard slog for restaurants in small towns. You just don't have the critical mass. You've got to be incredibly tight and careful. You, you can't overextend yourself. Um, you know, that whole idea of only opening three hours is because I really don't get enough people in those spare hours. I had to really push it together to make it, you know, a high volume for the hours we're open or else my labour costs will be too high. Yeah. What's been the impact on others in Castlemaine? Has there been restaurants switching to takeaway and has that had an impact on what you offer as well? Um, You know, there's always a bit of a, oh, another restaurant's opening. How is it going to affect us? And to be honest, because it's such a small town, if a new place opens, I'll notice a slight dip for three weeks. Uh, But I've got pretty loyal customers. Um, And so I tend not to panic. I used to. Like, you know, we've only really been around for slightly over a year. Um, but I've noticed in the trend, you know, people sort of try something different, but they come back. Um, there are a lot of coffee shops in this town. I probably wouldn't need another, you know, and there is that thing. The local dairy have told me that they, you know, they still deliver the same amount of milk that they did, say, 10, 15 years ago. They're just delivering it to more places in the town, whereas it used to be one or two coffee shops. The same volume is just going out to lots more places. So, you know, we're all sharing a piece of a pie that's not really going to grow in size. Um, So, yeah, I I think um, they might have affected me slightly. I will say this. There's a little bit of acknowledgement of your neighbours. You know, people were encouraging me to do delivery when I first shut down. And I considered it, there were a number of reasons I didn't want to, but one thing I thought was, okay, there are three or four restaurants already delivering. And if I jump into that market as well, then those guys are not gonna make as much. I'm not gonna make as much. You really do have to think that way in a small town. You've been cooking for 20 years and um, worked in fine dining and uh, and also you briefly mentioned Canada. Can you, can you tell us what you've taken from that fine dining world and how you, why you've transformed into almost the opposite? Yeah, it's a funny journey. Um, yeah, I, it's interesting because I really have come a full circle. Uh, when I moved to Canada, I met my husband in Vietnam just on a holiday, but he, he, you know, I went to stay with him in Canada. So I was on a tourist visa. I'd started cooking in Melbourne, but um, I, I realised I couldn't get any more tourist visas or even working visas I was getting into my late 20s so I I took a student visa and went to culinary school which is the way they sort of do it in North America and then you stage and you do practicums in restaurants rather than the apprentice route Um, and the cooking school I was at was a French culinary school it's now been bought out by the um, Art Institute of America but it was a French culinary school at the time and so I really sort of went from mod Oz sort of mid 90s kind of cooking to French seemed to all of a sudden really kind of be what I was looking at and learning and um, and I worked for the cooking school for a while as an assistant to guest chefs, so which was a great opportunity. I got to meet all these amazing chefs in Vancouver and who were visiting Vancouver. And it was a great way of networking because once I did get my residency and my working permit, I sort of had a choice of people to go back to because I'd assisted them in cooking classes. And I moved into a restaurant that was a Relais Gourmand restaurant and started in garde manger you know cold larder and and sort of worked my way up and and really that was my education besides you know the other kitchens that i'd worked in in australia and it was funny like i became very ambitious and i i did sort of move into the pastry department and worked my way up through there but then i got pregnant and um it kind of came crashing down on me i realized um you know, there's no place for a pregnant woman in this environment. You know, it was the year, it was the age of fax machines and the fax machine was right next to my department. And I watched those resumes come through 
just fast and furious through service. You'd get these faxes and these resumes of young people who didn't have babies or need to take time out to breastfeed or whatever else I was going to need. <laughs> and, you know, it was um, very competitive. It was very hard work, um, a little bit abusive. Um, it was tough. And although I had a real passion for food, there was something about it that was starting to hurt my soul. You know, I... Um, I was feeling there was too much food wastage. The restaurant uh, was owned by wealthy investors and there was, you know, I never got an education in costing, I have to say. Theoretically, I understood it, but we could play with whatever we wanted and a lot of waste, a lot of, um, I don't know, a lot of showing off as well. <laughs> I got to work. <laughs> I got to stage and I got to work and meet some amazing chefs who are also part of the Relais Gourmand organization like Thomas Keller and Charlie Trotter and Santi Tantorini and I was very caught up in it but when I stopped and had my baby things sort of changed and then I had another baby very quickly afterwards and it was funny all my friends in the kitchen when I said I was pregnant it was sort of like I was about to die and I was sort of kind of excited <laughs> but they were like oh my god God, you know, but I pre quite pretty quickly realized once I'd had the baby, there's no going back. Like, and it's, it's one of the reasons it's changing, but it's one of the reasons you don't see executive chefs who are women as often as you do men, because re-entering the workforce is really hard when there's all these young people who are willing to do a stage for free, <laughs> you know? Um, I was so, yeah, I was really at a crossroads and then was, as a parent, I was probably out not working for a couple of years and I just noticed there were no places that you could go with kids and uh, that actually had decent food, you know, in Vancouver. They didn't have much of a restaurant scene at the time in that sort of mid-range level. That was It was all sort of chain stores and Starbucks and I missed Australian cafes. So I opened an Australian cafe, I plonked a play area in it so that my kids could be there sometimes and opened a restaurant. And I was a bit green and naive. I was a little bit Pollyanna about it, thinking everything will just be fine. <laughs> and <laughs> it was a success immediately. Um, and it was and it was quite, you know, it did do really well. And it, uh, but it did sort of take me away from those children. It didn't, it, that, that was really ridiculous thinking my children could visit me in my restaurant. <laughs> and so it was exhausting. After seven years of it, the neighborhood gentrified, the rent was more than doubled. I kind of thought that's it, you know, I'm tired. And thought to myself, you know, I think I actually want to, um, do things on a very small scale. I became risk averse, you know what I mean? And so if I'm ever gonna do this again, I'm gonna make sure it's a very low investment for me because although I did, I was successful, I mean, I think I heard someone say on your show a few weeks ago and I thought, God, that's such a good line. Uh, what was it? Margins, uh, sorry, uh, revenue is flattery. <laughs> I'm gonna get it. Revenue is vanity, margins is sanity. And you know what? I make the same income with Superhero that I did from my other restaurant, Little Nest, wow. you know? I, and I work less, you know? I've kind of taken everything that worked, eliminated the things that don't, and I'm quite stubbornly not gonna do things for vanity, <laughs> you know? I'm not going to take everybody's, I, I, the one thing I did with my first business was take everybody's suggestion on board. You should do this, you should make those, you know? and. Um, I kind of dug myself a grave by just saying yes to everything and, you know, offering as much as I could and constantly changing the menu so people would, you know, find it fresh and exciting. Um, when really every time I changed the menu, people complained that I was taking something off the menu. Um, and what I found is here I do specials because I actually want to keep my cooks interested and um, engaged and not bored no one orders them they all get hooked on their regular thing <laughs> so i've got quite stubborn about no we're not doing specials right now we are being very careful <laughs> about wastage <laughs> waste of time and waste of food yeah for many that are at the crossroads at the moment uh, do you have any advice for sort of what steps to take to create turn their business into a more viable establishment that also gives them a bit more mm. life balance like you found 
I think now is a great opportunity. Um, I always advise against making lots of changes to your business. I mean, when I said I was adding things on, I was doing it in a way that was kind of enhancing the business. But if you're constantly doing things like changing your hours or changing your offerings, you confuse the buyer. People don't like it. They, don't, they won't even show up. They'll be like, I don't know if it's open or not, that kind of thing. Um, but at the moment, there's so much up in the air and there's so much kind of pivoting, as everyone says, you can get away with doing something that you thought might be a bad idea before, giving it a try. Um, you can, you know, if you're sort of looking at a lot of dead hours, but you feel like you should be open for, you know, X amount of hours, perhaps try cutting the hours back, you know, because as I said before, labor is a huge cost. And if you're sort of suffering through, you know, the first two hours of the day, you're barely getting customers. Well, those two hours could have been your prep time, you know? Um, so I guess what I'm saying is you could be a little bit experimental without, you know, making bold, you know, costly choices. But yeah, that would be my advice. If you've had a suspicion that you could make a change that would be really good, but you've been a bit cautious about upsetting customers, I don't think they'll be upset right now. Do you think this could be a positive sort of transformational period for the industry? Oh, God. I No. Uh, yes. Um, depends on who you are. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, oh, I don't know if I'm really a, uh, project, <laughs> able to project things like, for, you know, what it could do. I, look, I think that some restaurants aren't going to survive. And so when I say for some, yes, for some not, for those people, that's going to be devastating. But look, I think the most robust businesses are going to survive. And that probably means that it will, um, oh, what's the word? Lift our game. You know what I mean? Maybe restaurants that weren't quite doing it right and weren't quite doing as well are out of the mix. And I just think that sounds really mean to say that's good for the industry. But I think there is a bit of a glut in some ways. And um, so perhaps it is a, oh, I don't know how to say this without sounding like, oh, we're just gonna get rid of some stuff and it will be great because so many people will lose out there and that's pretty devastating. But I think when I said, you know, the robust businesses, the businesses that, you know, businesses that don't pay their staff super or taxes, you know, they're not going to be in a good position because they're probably not going to be able to get JobKeeper, you know, and uh, they're probably not even eligible if they haven't paid, you know, their bass. They're not maybe getting the stuff that the government was paying out. And so I think what, what would be good there is that that's not good for the industry, um, not being compliant, not playing your suppliers. That's not good for the food industry. And so... Yeah, I also hope, but I'm not sure that people will make connect the dots, that um, there will be better protection for staff. Um, some people probably think that, you know, staff get, you know, you know, labour cost is high, yes, and, in a, you know, compliance is incredibly expensive for us. But if we look at the hotspots in the cities, these are areas where people are doing work that is not well protected, not well regulated. Their travel is often, you know, a bit of a distance and they may be going to work when they shouldn't and they have employers who are maybe forcing them to work and maybe that will be a change that has to be made and that's something I've always thought should change in restaurants. A little earlier you mentioned about your husband growing too many herbs and vegetables and and mm. superheroes sort of came out of that. What, what sort of things is he growing there that you're using? Well, he, he grows a lot of greens that we just simply cook at home. Uh, we've tried incorporating home style Vietnamese soups because we did actually really want to share family favorites that you don't see in restaurants. But to be honest, people, love their their standard Vietnamese restaurant meals, you know? And so those ones, like I said, I, I'm really sort of, if it doesn't work, I don't do it. I try it quickly and I move on rather than wasting a lot of time and money on 
trying to push something down some people's throats. Uh, so a lot of Vietnamese greens that I wish I could give you the names of, and he always tells me and I don't really pay attention, <laughs> but he often has his own names for them as well. We, we grow a lot of Vietnamese celery, which is quite a sort of, it's quite perfumey, but there's definitely a celery note to it. We put that in soups a lot. Um, he grows Vietnamese mint, he grows Thai basil, mint, uh, coriander, lettuce, spring onions, um, you know, and those are things we use here. We've tried carrots and daikon, but really we don't get enough water. And so those, we, we just decided not to try that. And we get those from providers here, up here. Um, yeah, and he, I mean, along with that, he's, he's sort of really into permaculture. So he's got a bit of a food forest that he's kind of working on there. You know, there's all sorts of, you know, limes, lemons, oranges, grapefruits, you know, figs, pomegranates, plums, a bit of everything actually. Yeah. Having that, um, kind of a full circle with a lot of the produce that you use, is that, uh, have an impact on durability to, um, create a good margin for even though the average spend is quite low yeah it does when we're in season when we're off season the ch prices change but it definitely if you look at a yearly kind of budget yes but that's one thing I guess I'm really looking at now I'm in a position you know we I feel like we're in this holding kind of zone where I probably will change things here we may not even go back to eat in or it will be a much more minimal amount of seats is my thinking and we may start selling our produce here instead and using outdoor seating. Um, that's as long as people are willing to be takeaway only. If, if, if I had enough people saying to me, no, we really want to sit in, I'd do it. I'd go back to it a bit more. But at the moment, it seems that people really want to eat out, so take it away. So, uh, you know, I think one cost we've had in the country, Asian ingredients are expensive. And uh, just the, we, we go down to Melbourne to get our produce, um, like soy sauce, fish sauce, all that sort of stuff. And um, I want to try and maybe change and sell a lot more of that stuff simply so I have that stuff, more of that stuff on st in store. And we don't need to go there so often to get it. No one's delivering Asian suppliers aren't delivering to Castlemaine so we have to go get it and that's an expense and it is a little more costly than it is in the city obviously yeah some things we won't stop buying from the city um shout out to Fung at Toast Bakery in Footscray who makes our pate and makes most of Western Melbourne's pate for their baby yeah a little earlier you mentioned that Saturdays are the day when a lot of day trippers come from Melbourne uh, how are you feeling mm. about um, that again when Melbourne opens up again and having you know a lot of people come coming into town yeah a little nervous I mean yeah you know I want to be generous I you know I'm from Melbourne originally myself and um, and also know that a lot of people in Castlemaine have you know connections to Melbourne and so they have very viable reasons for being here. You know what I mean? Their family are up here or, you know, they were renting in Melbourne and they've lost their rental or whatever else it is. So um, I, I, I worry that people, we did sort of get a little sort of, I think everyone dropped the ball a little bit since we reopened, you know, and I just hope that we're a little more cautious this time. I trust that people coming into a small town will be yeah, that they'll be respectful. Um, I haven't really seen anyone, you know, I haven't heard of any big parties here or anything, you know. So I hope that, yeah, I'm probably we don't want a huge influx, but I think at the moment we've just got a few people who are probably already linked to Castlemaine anyway in some way, and that's that's okay. Yeah, I don't think I speak for all of Castlemaine either. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Mary, you have a show on Saturday mornings, Food for Thought. Yeah. We discuss food. How important is the discussion uh, in food in Australia for you at the moment? Hmm. Look, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's always an important discussion for me, one of the reasons I did the show. And it was also, um, 
Look, to be honest, the one thing I have to say with the, there's a joy in repetition I never thought I'd have making Bay Me and Boon and Fa all day long. I, when I, the younger me would be like, oh my God, the same three things over and over again. And there's something meditative about it in older age. Uh, but uh, as a younger cook, I just gobbled up all sorts of food information. I read a lot of books. I had lots of conversations with fellow chefs I was working with. I was always wanting to learn. And I have to say, that's something I have to hunt out now and push myself to do, to be cerebral and thoughtful about food. Um, and also, I mean, there's so many amazing food stories in this region and further afield. So um, I'm just a bit, I get a bit excited and I love the excitement that either providers or chefs or, you know, producers have when they're talking about their food. So it's, I think it's an important topic. I think, look, it's many layered. I think food security is really important. I think sustainability is incredibly important, particularly living in a place that's so affected by the climate. Um, but I also think food culture is really important and defining that and I love the way it evolves as well. So I'm sort of an anthropologist about it and I, I get really excited talking with the people, particularly in Castlemaine, about food. I've just got a co-host, Jane Grills, who she's the teacher at the local school for the uh, Stephanie Alexander program and also a food stylist. And that's been really good for me because I was getting too busy here and finding it almost too hard to keep up with. And having a co-host has really reinvigorated me to keep that show going, yeah. There are holes in the wall all over Australia serving food, you know, like you do. What what some mm. of the challenges of such a small family-run business like yours? Oh, yeah. Look... Before this, I would have said growth, like you're kind of limited unless you open a second location, but I don't know that a second location is ever a good idea either when you're this small. It's a kind of, growth is a hard one, like how much bigger can we get? We've only got this tiny kitchen and these four walls. Um, I think that one thing isolation did for me was help me to just think outside the box and look at things from a different angle, you know, and and realize that there are other ways of, you can get very set in your ways as a small business and think, no, we can't do it differently. We've got to just do it this way. This is the only way. And um, I think the one limitation is, yeah, your income, how much more can it grow? You know, your revenue, are you going to get any more sales? How many more hours can you do? That kind of thing. And I would say price is diff pricing is difficult because people sort of I mean as you said you know um, and as I said before you know it's a, it's a low income product but I am more expensive people who have bought a bang me in Melbourne would say oh a ten dollar bang me that's expensive but you know it's costly to me <laughs> it's it is like when you're a small little shop um, and it's not like the margins are huge so what I would say is put value on what you do, you know, and, um, you know, justify it with good quality. You know, if you, if you are making something that costs you a certain amount of money, well, you know, charge the right amount. And, um, I don't know, I keep thinking of different value you can add to it, but you can feel a little trapped by the size and it can be hard to see how you could build on it. But I think, one thing isolation did was allow me to look at different angles of ways I could build on it. Yeah. Well, let's look at that. What's the next year look like for Superhero and what are you most looking forward to? Um, oh, geez. Look, I am not sure what the next year of Superhero looks like and I really don't want to make predictions because it just seems to change constantly. What I would love to see is people able to wait inside instead of out in the cold or later it will be the heat. Um, I'd love to be able to sell fees produce here and, and also Asian ingredients that we use because at the moment we use a shed on our property as our storage room. Um, and uh, I would actually, what I'm really looking forward to prior to shutdown, I'd been chatting with a few other people in the region, Marsha Bussi from uh, Harvest in Bendigo and I had been talking about doing a dinner together and I had been so, we had been so close to sort of getting it up and going and then, you know, the first shutdown and I, I can't wait to do that. 
uh, Boomtown Wine here in Castlemaine had also talked about doing a collaborative dinner. I think I want to do a lot of those. I want to really have some celeb celebration of some sort in a socially distanced way. Um, and I think uh, moving forward, I'm looking forward to just being able to be a little less restricted, a little less worried. And um, yeah, I think it will be much the same. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my hopes for the future. Well, Mary, we've really loved having you give a different perspective on uh, the circumstances that we're all in. Um, please keep in touch and let us know how you go, especially, especially with the uh, dinners that you're proposing down the track as well. Um, thanks again and really, ha really loved having you on the show. Thank you, and I've really appreciated the podcast. I'd like to say that it's just been a really helpful resource for me. Even with, with my tiny little hole in the wall, I get a lot from it. So thank you. Thanks, Mary. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's HOSPO community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.